Okay, good evening. My name is Rochelle Collins, and um, I'd like to welcome you to Evening Sessions, which is a monthly program series featuring a mix of presentations on topics covering the arts, culture, history, science, and more. Our next evening sessions on September 15th will be Abraham Lincoln, The New Birth of Freedom. Kevin Wood as Abraham Lincoln will tell us the history of the United States during his time from his childhood on the frontier to the 12 turbulent years of the Civil War, um, from which we came out of it with a new birth of freedom. You can learn about the BCLS programs by subscribing to our newsletter on our homepage or by asking a librarian the next time you call to request a book. A couple other programs we have going on that aren't evening sessions are a program at the State Theater with New York Times bestselling author Jamie Ford on September 30th. Also beginning September 7th, every Tuesday we'll have a program with the MSU Extension on food preservation. This evening, we'd like to thank the Bay Arts Council for sponsoring tonight's program, Ordinary People by Extraordinary Artists. Well, let's welcome Cindy Patrick from the Detroit Institute of Arts. So thank you for joining us, Cindy, and I'll let you take over. Thank you, Rochelle. Hi, everyone, I'm Cindy Patrick. I've been a docent at the Detroit Institute of Arts for 15 years, and it's my uh, privilege and pleasure to be invited this evening by the Bay County Library System. Uh, to do a presentation talk for you. Um, and it, our topic this evening is Ordinary People by Extraordinary Artists. So our little um, presentation um, program is called Behind the Scene. You know, it's kind of a play on words behind the S-C-E-N-E, -E, um, but we call it S-E-E-N. So with that, I am going to start. Uh, so you can see on our opening page, as I said, this was um, an exhibition that was at the DIA in 2014 and 2015, and it was an exhibition by our prints, drawings, and photographs uh, curatorial department. So originally, everything that was on display would have been from the printmaking genre. We have added a few uh, other items to this talk to take it out to the public, uh, which aren't actually prints, but I will try to remember to tell you uh, which of those, you know, when we come to them. So it says works on paper um, by Degas, Renoir and friends. We've got lots of friends in here. Um, and I wanted to explain to you a little bit before I jump into the presentation about printmaking techniques because it's gonna come up during this talk. So we're gonna be talking about etching, lithography and engraving. Etching is a chemical process where a copper plate is used and the artist um, covers it with wax, uses like a, kind of looks like a roller that you would put paint on a wall with, and then um, cuts through the wax with a stylus. That copper plate is then set into an acid bath. And depending on how long it sits in the acid bath, that's how deep the grooves will be bitten into the copper plate. And the artist uh, or the printmaker manipulates that to create more darkness um, in the finished print. So from there, it's washed off, um, an ink is loaded, or brayers loaded with ink, and then artist goes over the entire copper plate, wipes it down, and then it goes through a printing press under you know, thousands of pounds of pressure. Engraving is very similar. Again, we're using a copper plate, except this is a physical process. It's not a chemical process. So with engraving, they actually take a stylus and dig right into the metal plate. So it takes a little bit more um, work on the part of the artist. And then the last one we're gonna talk about is lithography. And that is um, a process, it's a little bit different today because now we have everything, you know, the technology that we have is so much more advanced, but in the period of time that we're talking about tonight, which is around the 1870s, um, the lithography process was done by using stones. And so they would take a flattened stone that had been grinded very smooth and they would draw on it with grease pencils and the grease would create a resist. Again, this would go into some type of a acid type bath. Um, the acid bath would dig in wherever the grease wasn't. And then again, they would cover the uh, stone with ink and run it through uh, a printing press. The difficult part with lithography is that for every single color, you had to have a different stone. So it was very laborious, a lot, lot of work. Okay, we'll move on. We're gonna start with our friend, Edgar Degas. You can see that this uh, photograph is uh, circa 1895. 
if it was actually 1895, he would have been 61 years old um, when this photograph was taken. So Degas, uh, he was an interesting artist because he actually came from a family that had some money. He wasn't a starving artist. He originally trained to be a lawyer. And uh, when he decided and convinced his family that that was not his going to be his path in life, um, he went on to uh, study through the academic method of art uh, in Paris. So very, very well trained, very highly um, skilled artist. And he worked in all the different mediums. He painted, he did sculpture, um, he did printmaking, and he was interested in photography. I do want to talk a little bit about the historical um, aspect of where we're at in time. So we're going to be talking around, you know, like 1860, all the way up until the turn of the century. So I just want to put this on the timeline. So this was uh, during the time of the Industrial Revolution. People, you know, were leaving uh, agricultural type jobs to work in urban environments and cities. And life was changing because now instead of people having to, um, you know, work from dawn until dusk on a farm, they actually had like an eight to five job where in the evening they had leisure time. So it created a whole different like cafe society um, in Paris in the environs of Paris where people, you know, they had some spare time in the evening. And I'm talking about, you know, middle to lower class people, not just, you know, the aristocracy or the wealthy. Um, so it was a first. So taverns sprang up, theaters, you know, all different kinds of sports started to become popular, like horse racing, which, you know, up until then, you know, maybe it was polo and was really relegated to very wealthy people. But now you're, you know, your average Joe could actually partake in some of these uh, things. And the world was starting to really crave art and information. A couple of other things happened at this time. One was the invention of the camera, which was around 18, middle of 1840s. Uh, so artists no longer had to capture um, uh, someone's identity by creating a very super real portrait of them. They no longer had to paint a landscape uh, you know, in a super real method. We had cameras that could do that now. So artists decided to start uh, veering off and creating art that was a little bit more experimental. Another thing that happened was the invention of paint and tubes. And this took our artists out of the studio. Now they were able to go out, we call it plein air paint, which just means they were able to take their easel, their paints and go out and sit and actually look at a landscape or look at you know, a scene instead of having to maybe sketch, take those sketches back to the studio and then make a, a composite type of image. So those were some of the things that um, started to happen. And this, all of this led to the power of the print and printmaking. So we will continue on. So we'll start with this ballet dancer adjusting her costume. You can see this was done at the beginning of the 1870s. And then the one on the right is dancers in repose. This was, you know, almost at the end, the turn of the century. So in the first one where she's adjusting her costume, uh, Degas, this is a sketch. You know, he's working with a pencil sketch um, on kind of a, a heavy tooth paper. And you can see that this is done very spontaneously. Um, you can see where he's moved the legs back and forth, trying to get the right position. He's not really concerned with the identity of this dancer. You can see her head is kind of, you know, cocked downward. She's looking at uh, the, her hand that's trying to adjust the skirt or the tutu of her, her costume. Um, and you'll find that as we go along and we look at some of the other images um, in this presentation, uh, identity of the of the sitter really wasn't that important. Um, it was really more about um, the atmospheric qualities of the weather. It was about the light effects of the room. Um, so these this new wave of artists were trying to do things in a different way. And honestly, it wasn't very well accepted at the at the very beginning. Uh, you can see he signed his name um, at the bottom right in red, and he often did sign in red. Uh, the one on the right, we have dancers in repose. And what's interesting here is that if you think about a photograph, sometimes, I mean, when we use our, our uh, cell phones, you know, we can take a, a snap and then we can crop it. And so they were experimenting with photography and cropping. And now you can see we're at the end of the 1800s, turn of the century. So photography is really in full force. So now these paintings started to look like compositionally photographs. You can see we don't have the full body of the woman up on the left-hand corner. 
you know, she's been cropped off. We only see, you know, half of her body, her head's kind of, you know, she's holding her head in her hands. So they're in repose. It's either before, um, before a performance or after. And the other thing that he's done here is he's elongated their, um, their limbs. Uh, he's, he's taken an artist's liberty. And, you know, they look almost a little bit awkward. Um, this is actually a pastel sketch. Uh, so, you know, he's taken the liberty to make the composition more pleasing to him. Uh, so it's not about being, it's not about capturing the reality of the situation. It's more about the process of creating the work of art than it is about what's in the work of art. Again, we're with Edgar Degas. You can see this is only a year before the uh, Dancers in Repose. So this was a time when he was spending a lot of his working life um, in theaters. And because of his fame, he was allowed backstage at a lot of these theaters and he was allowed to see these very intimate moments um, of the performers. So again, this is an interesting pastel because, uh, you know, you would think about a portrait of someone being full on, full frontal, where you could capture their identity. He's not concerned at all of the identity of these three dancers. You know, they're, you know, two of the, one face is cut off, the other face is completely blocked. And then the one that's in the foreground is just her profile. Again, you can see that the arms are a little bit awkwardly um, placed. It was really all about what he wanted the composition to do. So if you look at those three arms in the, in the composition, they kind of take you around in a circle. Uh, so that was a, a compositional technique that he was using. Uh, pastels were uh, uh, outside of the printmaking realm. And as I said, we added a few um, other images to this presentation. So pastels were chalks. And they were very popular and were very much in vogue in the 1800s uh, because they were portable, didn't have to mix the paint. And if you've ever worked with chalk or pastels, you know that you can move them around with your finger and kind of mix them right on um, the paper. The only problem with pastels is that they're not very stable. And so we're lucky that this pastel actually has, you know, survived, you know, a couple hundred years and is still in such great condition. Um, I also wanted to mention that everything that we're going to be looking at here, with the exception of the photographs of the artists, are works of art that are in the DIA's permanent collection. Again, here we have dancers in the green room. This is an oil painting on canvas. It's not large. Um, oh, gosh, maybe about maybe about two feet wide and maybe about 15 or 16 inches tall. Uh, when you see it in the galleries at the DIA, it looks bigger because it's got a very big ornate frame on it. So sometimes when they take these out of the frames uh, for us and they take them back into conservation to work on them and we see them out of the frame, we're like so shocked because they seem so small because we're used to seeing them in a big frame. So here we've got these dancers and they're in the green room, which Obviously, this room is not green. Green room then and green room today just means kind of a holding area before uh, people go on stage. So you've probably heard on some of the nighttime talk shows, you know, the, the uh, next guest is waiting for us in the green room. So our dancers are in the green room. Again, we don't know if this is uh, prior to uh, a performance or afterward. I'm kind of leaning toward it being prior to because I see that one audacious uh, ballerina on the left kind of in the center of the painting and she's got uh, she's got her foot up on it looks like it might be a, a large uh, viola or a cello I mean who would have the audacity to put their foot on someone's stringed instrument it looks like her foot's right across the strings so we can see her she's tying her uh, ballet slipper which makes me think it's prior to a performance um, the one that would be directly below her. Uh, looks like she's adjusting something on her slippers. The one that's up to the right is tying uh, some kind of a scarf around her neck and across her back, or maybe untying it, probably untying because this is probably something to just keep her warm until the performance. I do wanna talk about uh, what he's done here compositionally. So you see that wall is bisected by a line above it. It's sort of a, a chartreuse or yellow and below it, it's sort of a rust color. So he's done that uh, very, uh, he's done that with meaning um, because that line draws our eye all the way across from the left into the center of that painting. 
And then again, he's using this technique of the three woman and they almost, if you follow them around, they kind of take you in a circle. Um, so these are compositional techniques that he was, he was very aware of. And as I said, you know, he had been trained as an academic uh, painter. So he was using techniques that, you know, had come from years and years of, of the study of art. Um, you know, here we are pretty close to the turn of the century, and he became very enamored of painting female nudes, drawing female nudes, sculpting female nudes. Um, I don't know if you know this about Degas, but toward the end of his life, uh, his vision was quite impaired. And so he took up sculpting when he could no longer um, see well enough to draw. And I'm sure that most of you are probably familiar with his lovely ballet dancer sculptures with the, the little net tutus that you know museums around the world are lucky enough to own. Usually they're quite small because he would have had to been able to, to handle them and with you know the impaired vision that wouldn't have been so easy. But sometimes we talk about these sculptures because we think about the fact that it had to be extremely tactile for him because of his impaired vision. And maybe that's why they're so beautiful to us today. So here we have on the left, leaving the bath three. Um, the three there means, I believe this one was a lithograph. Um, sometimes they would work on different states of a print. So they might do the first proof of it, print it, say, you know, there's a little more, I might like, I might like to add a little bit more shadow here, uh, maybe more contour line in the spot, print it again, that would be the second state third state, fourth state, until they got to the point of where they felt that it was a finished print. And that was when they would start printing and signing them at the bottom, one, you know, one of 60, one, two of 60. On the right, we have another pastel, and this is a seated new, uh, seated new woman brushing hair. So both of these are very intimate moments um, that, I guess when we talk about these ordinary people by extraordinary artists. Really, they were, they were looking for, as opposed to painting, um, you know, portraits of the aristocracy or monumental landscapes, they were really honed in on painting, drawing, sculpting, very intimate, spontaneous moments. So what he's done here on the left, you can see she's got a couch next to her and she's drawing the back of her leg. And then on the right are other seated nude. This is another intimate one where she's brushing her hair. And I don't know if you can see, but on the right hand side, there's, there is, she's sitting on the edge of a tub. So he's working with color here too, in an interesting way, because her hair is sort of a, a, a reddish russet color. And then if you'll notice around her, um, he's kind of picked out the area behind her with kind of a turquoise blue. So these two colors are called secondary colors on the color wheel, and they do kind of um, complement each other. So when we see this, this orange against this kind of turquoise blue, it pleases our eye. We don't know why, but when I'm telling you about this color wheel, that's the reason why. It's pleasing to our eye. So I was talking about how sporting events, you know, had moved from being something that would have just been viewed or participated in by, you know, the very wealthy, you know, ruling class patricians. And now with people having leisure time, you know, because now they're working in factories and they have the night off or the weekend off, now they're able to partake in watching um, things like horse racing, horse racing, fencing, things like that. So this landscape, um, done by Degas. And as I said, he would not have been sitting in a field, you know, sketching and painting this with an easel. He would have done singular sketches and brought them back and married them together to create this composition. That was the way he, that he worked. So in the foreground, we can see we have jockeys and we know they're jockeys because they're all wearing what they call their silks or their uniforms um, that are in different colors, usually top and bottom, you know, or are, are, don't match and the uh, cap will match um, the vest that's over there, blues on shirt. How interesting though, that instead of painting a landscape or painting an event that's the actual race, he chooses this very quiet moment that people who go to sporting events would never see. The jockeys are out, you know, they're letting their horses graze prior to or after a race. And I almost think about 
when I look at this painting, it's almost an advertisement for um, Degas, uh, you know, perfect technique as an artist, because he's showing us a horse in profile, he's showing us a couple of horses from the rear, and then he's showing us a horse from the front all the way on the right. So he's really telling us, you know, I can paint a horse beautifully from any angle. Now, hopefully, can you see my cursor? Are you able to see my cursor? Uh, I'm not sure if you are, but I'll try it anyway. Uh, no, so we're not. You're not. Okay. So in the, in the foreground, you know, we have the horses and the riders. Then we go to the middle ground. You can see there's kind of a grassy pasture, but those are sort of like foothills. Then when we go to like the upper um, three quarters of the painting, we can see there's a little town um, sort of along that hillside. And in the, in the background, we have just the suggestion of mountains. So, you know, we're talking about artists right now who are from the impressionist um, era of painting. And toward the end of this uh, presentation, we'll be talking about the post-impressionist. So I want to talk about what the impressionists really were all about. So in the background, we have this suggestion of mountains. You know, it's not certainly not a perfect rendition of what mountains look like. So the Impressionists, as you can see with Degas, you know, they were doing this very sketchy kind of open, um, you can see their brush strokes on, on the canvas. And this was a really quite a departure from everything that had led up to this point. So in Paris at this time, we had something called the Art Academy. And every year they would have what they called a salon, which was really an art exhibition and sort of a, a contest. So when they saw the kinds of work that was coming through from these impressionist painters, they rejected them totally. They were like, we don't understand what you're doing. You know, we're used to seeing paintings where the hand of the painter doesn't even show, you know, they're glazed and lacquered to the point of where we don't see the hand of the painter. You know, they were used to realism. So this was really jarring for them. So Degas and the next few that we're going to be talking about, they banded together and they created their own group and decided to do their own exhibition because no one would exhibit them. And they really weren't sure how it was going to turn out. Um, I can't remember uh, exactly where in Paris this exhibition took place, but I do know that it was up a couple of stories in a building. So it took, you know, a couple of stair, you know, sets of stairs for people to get up there. So they weren't even sure people would be willing to climb the stairs to look at their exhibition. Well, guess what? From the very beginning, people loved it, whether they understood it or not. They loved the color. They loved the idea of the atmospheric qualities of it. They loved the idea of the light effects. And when they did that exhibition, people were lined up around the block to get in to see it. So it was a success right from the get-go. This is called Russet Landscape. And our former um, curator for Prince, uh, Prince and Graphics uh, was a lady by the name of Nancy Soika. She has since retired. Uh, she was with the DIA for, I think, over 25 years. In her estimation, this was the most exquisite and valuable print in the DIA's collection. This is called a monotype or a mono print, mono meaning one. So another technique that these artists could use is they could take a plate and they could actually just work directly on the plate, sponging, wiping, stroking, um, maybe even you know, kind of taking their hand and pulling some of the color away. So they would apply the, the inks directly onto the plate. And then they would lay a piece of uh, paper that had been moistened on top. And in order to pick up uh, the ink that was on the plate, they either would rub it with their hand or they might even run it through a printing press. So this was one of those. This was a mono, mono print. Only one was created. And Degas created this. He had gone on vacation with some friends. And as they were traveling through the countryside, they were in a horse and carriage. And it was sort of like, um, not at twilight, but at, but at end of day, when the sun is setting and the beautiful colors come across the landscape. And he was so moved by um, you know, the landscape that he was seeing from this carriage that as soon as he got into the, his own studio, he started 
to make this print. And he did uh, several of these mono prints. So as I said, this is considered to be one of the most important prints in the DIA's collection. And part of the reason for that is it actually has his fingerprints on the print in several different places. So really, uh, you know, the, the, a part of the artist lives on in this beautiful print. Uh, here we have a couple of um, kind of one-off portraits that were done by Degay of his buddies. So one of his contemporaries was Manet, and you can see he's seated here. He's kind of turned to the right in a contemplative kind of a pose. And um, on the right, we see Boussard, who was a photographer. And this is done in gouache, which is a kind of a uh, opaque watercolor. So as I said, Degas used all different kinds of mediums. Can you see where it looks like he started to put his hand extending out in front of him and then decided that he didn't like that idea and kind of tried to paint it out? It's interesting how it didn't matter to him that, you know, these changes were made. These were considered to be, you know, fully formed works of art. They weren't just sketches to be tossed away. Uh, now we're going to move on to Manet. And Edouard Manet, as I said, he was a contemporary of, um, of Renoir. But Manet, he was really the radical of the group. He was the innovator um, in many different ways, which we'll see as, as we continue on. Uh, so one of the, you know, they, they usually would use as their, um, their models or sitters, people who were close to them, you know, that way they didn't have to pay for a professional model. So Bert Morisot, who was also an artist, happened to be married to Edouard Manet's brother. And so she was actually his sister-in-law. So she, he, she was accessible to him. So here we have on the uh, left side, that is an etching. And then on the right, he's created uh, um, another image as a lithograph. So in the etching on the left, I think it's a good um, comparison to let you see how the different uh, mediums can make, um, can bring across the feeling of the sitter. So this was actually when Bert was in uh, mourning for her father, he had died. And so she was dressed, you know, all in black, her widow's weeds. But I want you to look at her eyes. So on the left side in the etching, you know, we can kind of see her eyes are sketched pretty well. They're not staring directly at us though. They're staring kind of off, off to the left, would be our left. Um, and then on the right, when he created it as a lithograph, the eyes, you know, are much more piercing. I mean, it's like the first thing you notice when you look at her are those, those piercing eyes. Uh, these two are actually etchings, and they actually, in my opinion, they should have been reversed in this presentation um, because they're show it's showing it in two different states of being inked. It's called At the Prado. So remember, we were uh, talking about earlier how um, people were able to spend time in other ways other than just, you know, working from, you know, daybreak until dusk or, or until, you know, nightfall. So one of the things they were able to do is they were able to visit museums. So here, um, Manet had visited the Prado in Spain, and he did this etching of just a group of people, very well dressed, who were um, outdoors, you know, kind of strolling around at the museum. So on the right hand side, this would be um, one of the earlier stages of the etching where he's inked it and he's wiped away a lot of the ink. So as you can see, you can see a lot more of the line work and where he used kind of cross hatching and um, line work to show um, the shape of this woman. On the left side, he added a lot more ink, um, on, especially on the, the figure that's in the forefront. And so we lose some of the detail uh, in her dress. You know, I think this might have been the last state, and from this one, he would have printed several copies. So Manet liked the printmaking medium because he liked being able to make multiples of uh, an image. You know, people had um, a little bit easier of a life, and they were able to earn money a little bit more easily. And now they actually had some extra money to spend for luxury items, so people could buy these prints. They could hang them up in their homes. These were folks that would have never been able to afford art before. So he liked the, the uh, democratic way 
that he could distribute his art by doing prints. I love to pronounce some of these words that we come across in our presentations. So this is a French word, polichinelle. It comes from the Italian world, word punchinello. Both are names for what we know in English as punch of Punch and Judy. So Polichinelle was a character who had been created for the uh, Commedia dell'arte, which was um, uh, puppet shows that they would do across Italy, and then it moved over into France. Uh, so when we look at this, the, the beauty of this print is that it's a lithograph and it's in color. Manet was the very first artist to explore and experiment with color lithography. And as I said before, each one of these colors would have had to have been on a different stone. So imagine how calculated he had to be to register this figure and align these stones perfectly so that the color would come up in exactly the spot where he wanted it to. As an example, let's look at the stockings. So, you know, in order to get the red stocking, he's got to have that stone line up exactly where the contour line of the outside of that stocking is. When he does the green stocking, new stone has to line up exactly. So it was very, it was a very laborious process and painstaking and time consuming and very calculated in the way that, um, in, the art, in the way that the artist would finally come to the realization that this was the actual print. So he had been hired to create a series of prints um, for a publisher, and this was one of those. I think it's interesting when, when we look at Punch, um, you know, most people who have ever seen uh, a puppet show Punch and Judy, you know that the attribute of Punch is that he's got that baton behind him. And we know what he did with that baton, baton to poor Judy. Um, and he always is shown with a beard and a mustache. But you can see our Polichinelle here. He's an older man. You know, he's got white, white hair, white eyebrows, you know, a white beard. And, you know, when I looked at this the first time, I was a little bit confused about right in the center there. Um, it kind of looks like it's dangling below his chin. You know, he's got that, that beautiful um, ruff around his neck. Uh, and I wondered, what is that? It's actually his other sleeve. He's got his hand kind of, you know, up under his chin like that. So that's his other sleeve. But it's a little bit puzzling when you first look at it. So, you know, we just looked at this print that was, you know, kind of um, fun loving and colorful. And, you know, the, the uh, subject matter was, you know, pretty light. But Manet wasn't satisfied with with just creating works of art like that for publishers. He was definitely a political activist and he created prints that would document what was going on at the time. So on the left, it's entitled Civil War. And this was done during the Franco-Prussian um, War and that had spread across Paris. And, you know, we can see that we've got you know, bodies in the front, in the back, we've got, you know, probably sandbags, or it might even be a wall that's falling down. And this was a time when all of Paris was overrun, you know, people were standing in line just to try to get meat to put on the table. And when he created these almost, they're almost like a journalistic documentation of what was going on. Think about, you know, photographs that we're seeing right now of what's been happening, you know, over the past couple of weeks. So Manet, you know, way back in the 1870s, had already grasped this idea of trying to document um, world events. Uh, so on the left, you know, we have this, you know, it's kind of a grisly scene. And then on the right, we have the execu execution of Maximilian. He created several different compositions, not only um, in, lith in lithographs, but also in paintings of this same subject. So Maximilian had been installed in Mexico by Napoleon III as the emperor of Mexico. And of course, the Mexican people, I think at the time, um, the leader was Juarez. He had been deposed and pushed out. Well, the Mexican people were not happy with, you know, being ruled by, uh, you know, from afar by France. So, you know, they had, uh, they decided that they would create 
you know, the situation where they would execute Maximilian and take back uh, their own liberty. So here Manet has documented that event. And as I said, it was a, it was a very, um, it was a very well-known event that was at the forefront of the public eye at the time. So he created these prints, as I said, so they could be widely distributed, but guess what? When he created this print, the French government stepped in it would, and would not let it be, um, would not let the copies of this be distributed. So it had to kind of be done in secret. So, you know, we already had the press kind of manipulating uh, what the public would be able to see. I'm, I'm sorry, not the press. We already had the government manipulating kind of what uh, the people would see in here, which is something that we worry about today. So we move on to Pierre Auguste Renoir. Most of you who uh, have ever walked into a museum probably know uh, the name of Renoir. You know, he's up in this pantheon of the Impressionists. And a Renoir, I think at the time that this photograph was taken, he wasn't that old, maybe in his 40s. Um, and toward the end of his life, he suffered terribly from arthritis and actually couldn't even uh, continue to paint without having his paintbrushes taped to his hands. He couldn't hold them and grasp them, so he'd have them uh, taped to his hands. The descendants of Renoir all were creative people. You know, uh, one of his grandsons, um, I don't know if it's grandson or great grandson is a film producer today. Um, you know, several of his offspring, you know, they were also involved in the arts, either as actors or artists. So that creativity was in the DNA. Uh, here's a, you know, another one of these just spontaneous intimate por portraits of uh, Louis Valtat, who was also um, um, kind of coming onto the scene, but we would, we would relegate him to the post-impressionist because we can see this is after the turn of the century. And Renoir actually didn't start um, working with printmaking until late in his life. So, you know, any of the prints that we see done by him are going to be, you know, later on where, where the Impressionists is st starting to wane and the post-Impressionists are starting to uh, emerge. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Uh, so again, we have an, uh, you know, an, a fellow artist, young man, very young, when they cross paths. And, uh, you know, he's just in sort of a quiet moment, got his hand up on, you know, the arm of the chair, and, you know, just kind of in a, a restful pose. Again, we have a couple of other prints here. Uh, the one on the left is called Coco, and Coco was one of Renoir's uh, sons, the eldest of the two. And then there's just a, a sort of a a gesture of another child below. You can see there's a hand and that child is supposedly eating a biscuit. So that's his younger child, Jean. On the right side, we have the pinned hat and these are the nieces of Bert Morisot. So again, they knew, you know, these artists knew each other, they spent time together and they used each other's, uh, uh, not only friends, but also children as models. Uh, so, this kind of reminds me, the one on the right, of the paintings of Mary Cassatt or Bert Marisol, who both know, knew each other, um, because it's of, of women or of children in a quiet moment. And it would have been unusual for uh, a male artist to have access to um, a quiet, intimate moment like this with females. You know, Renoir did because obviously these were, you know, close friends. But commonly, um, when we see Impressionist artworks of women or children, um, they're, for the most part, done by, you know, one of the female Impressionist artists. Uh, and then you can see, again, this cropping technique up at the right. You know, we've got the hat that's cropped off. We only see part of it. Again, he's not very concerned with the, the model on the right. We don't see her face. We see her from the back. How interesting that he chose to have the models positioned in this way, as opposed to looking at them, you know, full on frontal. So moving on from Renoir, now we're going to talk about Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec. He is, in my mind, the bridge between the Impressionists and the Post-Impressionists. So Toulouse-Lautrec came from a family um, of 
aristocrats. His mother and father were a comte and a comtesse, which would be a count and a countess in France. And if you know anything of Toulouse-Lautrec, if you've ever seen the movie Moulin Rouge, you probably you know, would remember um, uh, the actor who played him. Toulouse-Lautrec wasn't a dwarf, but he suffered from something called pictodysostosis, which was an affliction caused by inbreeding. So his parents were actually first cousins. Um, they shared uh, a grandmother. And because of the inbreeding, uh, he suffered from this. And what, what it caused for him was he had a normal sized adult torso, but his limbs, his arms and legs would have been the size of a child's limbs. So he, at full height, um, as a mature adult, he was only four foot eight. And truly, you know, someone like him back in medieval times would have been welcomed at court, would have been someone who would have you know, um, been an entertainment for people at court. But in the time that he lived, he, he was an outcast. Fortunately for him, he came from this wealthy family. And so he was able to completely indulge in his artistic uh, pleasure. He didn't have to worry about making a living from his art, but he was very prolific. Um, he only lived to be 36. Um, at the time of his death, you know, he was suffering from a venereal disease and he was also an alcoholic. So at 36, really the alcoholism what was, took, was what took his life. Um, and in Paris, in the cafe society at this time, people drank something called absinthe. And it had a hallucinogenic effect to it, but it also was, had some toxicity. Um, and people who you know, drank a lot of absinthe suffered the consequences. But he was such a heavy drinker that he even carried a hollowed out cane that he could keep um, spirits in so that he would never be without alcohol. This was, this was created, it's called At the Circus. Uh, you know, there were times in his life when his family would actually have him um, committed um, into, I guess we call it then they called them asylums. Today, we would call it rehab. And so as part of his rehab, he had to draw, I think it was 39 sketches to prove that he was fit enough to leave uh, the asylum. So this was one of those sketches. It's called At the Circus, but it really isn't a circus. It's a stage. And you can see that the performers are dressed in sort of Japanese style uh, costumes. If you see the, uh, the one who's got her back to her, she's got an obi sash on the back of her um, costume. And then she's got, you know, kind of a geisha type hairdo. And she's got, you know, these different ornaments kind of sticking in to hold that geisha hair to together. She's holding a Japanese fan. The interesting part about this is this was an actual theatrical event that he had um, witnessed from the audience, where on the stage, they flooded the entire stage with water. And that's the blue part that you see. And then they had these lily pads that looked as if they were floating. They were actually structured so that they were connected to the stage, but sat up above um, the level of the water. And the dancers, you know, did a performance moving back and forth on these lily pads. But how interesting that Lautrec decided to give us a perspective, not from the audience, we're actually on the stage with the dancers. It's as if we're one of the dancers standing behind the back of this one with the obi sash. So this was another part of this whole impressionist ideal of giving us vantage points that were very unusual. Either we're looking at it from a bird's eye view from above, we might be looking at it um, from a worm's eye view from below, or you know, sometimes we're right up on stage with the dancers. Oh, Miss Lowy Fuller, she was from Chicago, good old USA. And she was a dancer and she had this, um, she had this dance routine where she wore these fluttering diaphanous type gowns and attached to her hands were poles. 
and they moved up through the gown so that she could create these wing-like shapes as she danced. I would invite you to go, uh, after we're done with the presentation, go online and just look up Loey Fuller's Serpentine Dance. There are many videos of her doing this dance. Um, and it was, it was like the, the fad of all of Paris. She was known really all over the world for doing this dance. So Lautrec had um, been in the audience at one of these performances and was so moved by it that when he you know, came back to his studio, he decided to create um, with lithography uh, a whole series of prints based on her dance. So here we can see her dancing. While she was dancing, her brother was her lighting technician and he would shine colored lights on her as she danced and move them around so that you know her gown would look like it was changing colors. And when Lautrec uh, did this series of prints, he tried to mimic that by taking um, not, only, not only inking um, the lithographic stone, but when he was done with the prints, he took um, iridescent dust and kind of like threw it across uh, the print so that it would have an iridescent or reflective quality to it. So each and every one of them were different. So uh, because of the way that he would move, you know, this dust across. So I think in the next one, unfortunately, this I tried to add a video in here and I was able to do it, but it would be, um, it would have to start with an ad beforehand. And I didn't want to have to put you folks through watching an ad for five or six seconds. So this is uh, Loey Fuller doing her serpentine dance. And you can see where those, um, where her arms are extended with those rods. So she would twirl and move and these, you know, these beautiful um, diaphanous gowns would just, it was such a spectacle. Um, and everyone, you know, she, she had international fame because of it. So take a look at the video later. Oh, no, we don't want to do that. We want to move on. Oh, maybe it's going to let us see it. What do you know? Uh, so I think this one might have been, um, this particular little video might have been done by Thomas Edison because he was one of the precursors of actually creating uh, movies. So can you see how the color changes by the, the way her brother is shining the light on her? I mean, to us today, it seems kind of tame, but believe me, back then it was magnificent. Oops, let me go back one. All right, so here we have uh, Le, Le Divan Japonais, and that translated into English is the Japanese couch. This was a club or a cafe. Um, by cafe, we don't mean like a coffee cafe, like we know, we just mean a place where people could meet, drink, and maybe watch a small performance. So Lautrec was hired by the owner of Divan Japonais to create advertising posters for the performances. So being, you know, the radical artist um, of the, you know, kind of the tail end of the Impressionist movement, the performer that he was supposed to highlight in this poster is the woman up at the left with the black gloves. Her head's cut off. But guess what? Everyone would have known that this was Yvette Guibert because she was the only actress who wore those black gloves. And it just so happened that um, Lautrec had had a long standing affair with her. So we don't know if he cut her head off to be cruel or if he cut her head off just as kind of a, a joke. Um, but sitting in the front, we have this redheaded woman that is Jane Avril. She was a Moulin Rouge dancer, can-can dancer. Everyone knew who she was by her red hair. So again, we have this unusual perspective. We're in the audience. We are sitting almost as if we could be sitting right next to Jane Avril, getting ready to watch um, Yvette Guibert, you know, sing or do her whatever act she's going to do with her theatrical performance. So how different that he... Um, put all the emphasis on this woman in the audience who was also well-known instead of 
the person that he was supposed to be creating the ad for. And look at how he kind of floated the, uh, the type across the top to let you know where it was at, the address. And then on the bottom left, you can see the owner of uh, Le Divan Japonais was Ed Fournier. Oh, I, I wanted to mention, if you can see above her hand holding the fan, um, she's got, we kind of see the um, orchestra pit. We've got the, you know, the top end of probably a cello and maybe a viola. We've got the conductor uh, right in front of her face. And then next to her was a gentleman who was an art critic. I can't remember his name uh, at the moment, but, you know, he's got his cane in his hand and they're getting ready to watch the performance. And then on the lower um, left-hand side up above the word Ed is some kind of a little something ornament. I can never figure out what it is. No one's ever been able to tell me what it is. Um, maybe it's her little handbag that she set up there. Oh, and then right above her arm, you can see she's got her champagne glass. Um, again, Lautrec uh, spent a lot of time backstage. He definitely lived with the cafe crowd, you know, because of his alcoholism, he was out every night drinking and partying it up um, everywhere he went. Um, he frequented houses of prostitution um, because of his affliction and because of being an outcast. You know, he, he really couldn't um, live his life in the realm of the aristocracy that he came from. So he you know, here was where he could fit in among the theatrical folk. So on the left, we have Judique and Dihol. This is just a moment backstage where these two actors are getting ready to go out and perform. You can see there's someone behind her pulling her corset together, um, you know, tightening up the, the laces of her corset. And he has the light effect coming from the bottom. And it might have been a gaslight, but it kind of gives an eerie quality to uh, Dio's face. You know, it's, it's not flattering at all. It's kind of an eerie quality. On the right, it says at the Moulin Rouge, um, Franco-Prussian. So we talked about the Franco-Prussian War. This is kind of a, a, a little satirical um, composition. On the left, we have, you know, someone who's dressed up in Parisian, uh, trendy type clothing. And on the right, we have someone who's got kind of Germanic features. And what he was trying to say with this print was that, you know, the Franco-Prussian War in our world, in our cafe society, out on the streets of Paris, we all get along. Whether we're French, whether we're German, we all get along. Moving on to Edouard Viard. Now we're starting to move into this uh, area called post-Impressionism. And we are, and a couple of the other ones that we're going to look at, um, called themselves the NABI, N-A-B-I-S. I just went to the Cleveland Museum of Art last Sunday, and they have an exhibition on the NABI artists. So if you happen to you know, get down to that area of uh, Ohio, um, stop in. Uh, so the NABI, NABI was a Hebrew word that meant the prophets. So a lot of times when these artists would create um, a, a new group or a new vision or a new movement or a new artistic trend, they would write these uh, tracts or treatises that would not only cover uh, <clears throat> and formalize uh, the elements of their artistic expression, but they usually had a political statement to them as well. And so the prophets or the Nabi, um, they kind of lean toward mysticism and a lot of their artwork has uh, erotic elements to it. So they were kind of a, a, a spiritualistic kind of a deep uh, type of movement. So here we, you can see with his eyes, I think he looks like he's, um, he looks like a prophet. So Viard was experimenting with color techniques in uh, his printing. These are lithographs. And I think it's, it's really very evident in the two of these and we compare them because the one on the left is just done in the, the first state in black and white. And it's so abstract that you really can't tell what, what is going on. It do, really doesn't make much sense. But once he applies uh, the chartreuse and a kind of a, a lavender purple color to it, then we can pick out that what we're looking at, instead of looking at the performers on the stage in a theater, 
Again, we have an artist looking from a different unusual vantage point. He's looking at the people in the audience. So you see that big swath of yellow. Above that is a loge or a balcony of, of the audience. And then to the right would be like the, the main floor or the mezzanine of the audience. So he's not concerned with the performers on the stage. He's more concerned with the audience. Uh, this is Children's Play, also by Vuillard. So, you know, these artists, as I said, you know, they spent a lot of time looking at people out in the streets, looking at performers backstage, and they also spent a lot of time in parks, like we saw at the Prado with many. So this is a very odd color lithograph because we have this giant figure to the left bending over, tickling a baby. And then we have kind of a red dot right in the middle. And then we have all these figures that are sort of milling about in the background and fading, you know, all the way back into the, the you know, the real far background. What Vuillard was trying to show here was perspective. So the figure that is the closest to us looks large because she's near us. The figures that we see that are smaller would have been farther away from us. And then in the background, you can see that um, the line work becomes kind of sketchy and almost diffused. Because if you think about looking off at a landscape in the distance, the further away it is, the more difficult it is to actually pick out the details. It be, you know, the atmosphere actually sort of gets in the way and makes it look fuzzier and fuzzier. So that's what he was trying to accomplish in this print. And, you know, I'm not sure how successful he was when I first looked at it, I couldn't figure it out. I needed someone to explain it to me. But, you know, after I had that explanation, then I got it. So hopefully I explained it as well to you. Bonard, another of the group of uh, Nabi. And he was, you know, as I said, people were very, um, very apt to spend their money on these, you know, art prints. Uh, you know, they were affordable, they could buy them on the street, and they, you know, anybody could, you know, now decorate their wall with art. So not only were these prints being created in France, you know, we don't live in a vacuum and they didn't either. You know, these prints were being, uh, these types of prints were being created across the globe. And the French were very interested in Japanese woodblock prints. So this is where they would take a block of very hard wood and they would use chisels to cut out the line work and the shading. And then they would um, take the block they would print each color separately, as I said before, and they'd have to re-register um, the image to make sure that it all lined up. So Bonard, among the Nabi, was very aware of these Japanese woodblock prints. And this particular print by him is definitely um, uh, influenced by that because we have these large areas of solid color, you know, the black of the lampshade, the red of the table. And here we're looking at uh, the scene from a bird's eye view. It's almost as if we're hovering above um, this child who's, you know, playing with a little toy on the table. It looks like it could be a little piece of a train. And then the other little hand is just kind of creeping up, you know, up above over the tabletop. So notice that he's really not interested in defining the, um, the features of the, the infant's face. Just a suggestion of eyes, nose, and mouth, not, not, not extremely detailed. Uh, again, Bernard is out, you know, out in the streets where people are enjoying life. You know, they're out on the boulevard. They would get dressed up in the evening. They would ride in their carriages pulled by, you know, horse-drawn carriages pulled by horses. And the street scene was where it was at, the cafes and the taverns. Everyone wanted to be seen out at night. Um, and spend time in these cafes and these taverns. On the left, um, we have another street scene and you can see that he's used color to pick out some of the details of the windows in the background and then also on the hat of the person who is right in the center. Um, we're coming pretty close to the close of our, um, our talk here. Yes, we are. So Cezanne. Now he's a little bit out of order here because he was definitely part of the Impressionist movement. 
um, as opposed to post-impressionists. He was not part of the Nabi. He was definitely um, with the impressionist group of Renoir, Degas. You know, they knew each other. Um, they were influenced by each other. They spent time together. And Cezanne was one of those big radicals. I think this Renoir sketch of Cezanne is interesting because it looks so much like, whoops, see if I can go back. Well, it looks so much like his photograph. Um, looks like he might be a little bit older in this one. And then he's done a self-portrait uh, later. You know, this is like 1898. He's got his goatee, but he hasn't uh, colored it in. It, it makes him look like he's older because he didn't shade in the goatee. So I believe this might be the last uh, uh, work of art in the uh, presentation tonight. So this is the bathers, as I said, you know, along the way during the, the uh, middle of the 1800s up to the turn of the century, you know, nudes and bathing scenes became, you know, very popular and were at the forefront of all of these artists' uh, compositions. But I want you to take a, a careful look at this scene because it is not, these are not idealized, beautiful people. They're clunky, they're chunky. Um, think of, you know, Roman, beautiful, idealized Roman marble statuary or Greek statuary. These folks are not idealized. They are not meant to look like anything other than average human beings. Uh, but the composition itself is awkward. You know, we've got this fellow in the center who almost looks like he's kind of floating, doesn't look as if he's actually standing on the ground. You know, we've got the one to the left who's kind of looks almost as if he's pulling his head over to the side. Um, it's a very, very odd composition. And that's what Cezanne wanted. He wanted us to look at this and be puzzled. He wanted us to look at it and try to noodle out what was going on here. In the background, um, you can see there are mountains. This is Mont Saint-Victoire. And Cezanne painted it hundreds and hundreds of times. Um, painted it, you know, sketched it and put it in, um, you know, as I said, his prints. It was probably his most favorite subject. Almost like if we think about Monet with his water lilies that he painted over and over again from his garden in Givernay, Cezanne painted Mont Saint-Victoire. If you walk into a museum and you go into the Impressionist galleries and you see a painting, of um, you know, a singular mountain with you know, some blue around it. I bet you if you walk up, you're gonna see that it was done by Cezanne. So I wanted just to, in closing, um, I just wanted to kind of recap and say that you know, the artists at this time felt that uh, the traditional art um, style and system was restrictive. Um, the salons, the large public exhibitions all rejected you know, what the Impressionists were doing. Uh, those salons were run by the government approved um, uh, groups. They had very conservative juries. They only accepted works that were in that really highly traditional academic style. So in retaliation, you know, the artists that we looked at uh, this evening were the ones that, who were the ones who said, you know, we're going to continue to do what we want to do in a different way. And we're going to you know, we're going to find a way to get it out to the public. So as I said, their first exhibition was very successful. And not only did they paint, but they started to explore printmaking so they so that they could more widely disseminate their art and be more democratic about who was able to own it. Um, so the, some of the subject matter that they tackled going forward were things like railroads, factories, and for the most part, city life. Um, some of the new techniques that they experimented with, just to recap, was the use of color as a vehicle of expression. If we think about um, the Vuillard, where we had the one on the left that was abstract, and then when you added color, we could actually figure it out. Uh, they made deliberate choices to leave works without a smooth finish. You could see the artist's brush strokes. You could see, as we said, in Russet Landscape, um, we could see Degas' actual, you know, I'm sorry, uh, Renoir's actual fingers, you know, fingerprints, thumbprints. And then their emphasis was on emotion of the characters over realistic qualities. We, we weren't really concerned about so much the identity of a person. We were trying to show the emotion of the intimate moment. So they were deliberate about what they were doing. They were calculated in the processes that they were using, which were sometimes very laborious and technical, but they were very successful. And they were able to really thumb their nose at the salon 
um, and we're successful in spite of them. So at this time, I'd like to open it up if we have any questions, I'll do my best to answer them. I wanna thank everyone for your attention uh, this evening. I hope that you enjoyed uh, looking at this uh, uh, presentation from uh, the DIA's permanent collection. And I invite you, please travel down to the DIA. It's open Wednesday through Sunday. Um, you do have to make a reservation uh, via the DIA's website. And um, they do that just so that they can keep um, the numbers of folks down to about 300 an hour to keep everyone safe. Um, you do have to wear a mask while you're there. And they're very careful. We haven't had any outbreaks, outbreaks at the DIA. They, they know what they're doing. They're doing a good job. So I invite you to visit the DIA. All right, with that, I'll go back to Rochelle. And if we have any questions. Yeah, if anybody has any questions, you can um, either put it in the chat or you can unmute. Um, we do want to thank Cindy for joining us and uh, great presentation. We really appreciate it. Well, it doesn't look like we're getting any questions. Um, oh, some people are commenting. Thank you. It was a wonderful, informative presentation. Well, you know, folks, when the, when the pandemic started, my biggest fear was after being a docent in the museum for 15 years and spending, you know, gosh, at one time I was there five days a week. Then I got it down to about three days a week. I thought, what am I going to do with myself? You know, my interaction is with people every day. What am I going to do? And so right away, we were able to, you know, we, you've, a word you've heard, you know, a lot lately is pivot to doing these virtual or stream talks. And when I was first asked to do it, I had already been doing them for a while because I'd been asked to do some for a group called Def Can. And they were um, talks that were accompanied by a signer who did sign language. So I've been experimenting with that. I've been doing some senior talks for people that were homebound. Uh, so they, they came to me as one of the first. And I was like, well, you know, I have a little bit of experience. But now we had this different technology where we were going to stream to a lot of people. And it presented some technical challenges uh, for us. But we learned along the way. And um, the one thing that I think I've learned is to be very flexible because anything can happen <laughs> during one of these talks or sometimes before one of these talks. So um, I appreciate that everyone uh, who, who gave their time tonight to, to join uh, us and to listen to me. Um, thank you. It's gratifying to me to be able to have a way to still have an audience to talk to. So I appreciate that so much. Thank you for inviting me. It's been a privilege. And um, gay Bay County Library System. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Thanks, Cindy. Um, don't forget the uh, 15th of September, we have Abe Lincoln. Kevin Wood is Abe Lincoln. He is, he looks like him. He, he answers as him. He, you can't trick him into saying, hey, what did he do? He says, I did. Um, it's pretty cool. So we hope you can join us on the 15th. And uh, thanks again, Cindy. And I hope you guys all enjoyed the program. Um, there was a question that just came in. It said, oh. are the virtual programs listed at the DIA? Uh, you can go on the DIA's website, and I think it might be under events. And if you want to see some of the ones that we've done, I mean, gosh, I think we've probably done about 20 of them already. Um, you can go on YouTube and just type in Thursdays at the museum, DIA, uh, or TATM DIA, and a bunch of them will pop up. Um, I mean, this one's probably in there too. We, we did this, you know, as a Thursdays at the museum talk. Um, so either go, go to the dia.org um, website and look under events, or you can go right to YouTube. And I think that the ones with sign language are on the DIA's website, um, which is great because, you know, that was something that I was doing before we started the virtual um, talks or the streaming, and they were able to put those on the website so that, you know, folks who are hearing impaired can now enjoy our talks as well. Um, we haven't quite figured out yet. Um, we do closed captioning on some of them, but we haven't quite figured out um, the technology for adding in an interpreter on screen. Um, Def Can, that group, uh, provided that technology. Uh, but anyway, so YouTube is great. You can see pretty much anything you want to see. But look up Thursdays at the museum. And honestly, um, I'm, I'm going to say there's probably about 20 of them on there. 
All right, thanks. Thank right, you. Everyone. Have a good evening. Thank you.